Steve, Steve, I got a camera on. sending your son who did what we could not do for ourselves. And it's by his very presence this morning that you're going to speak to us through, through your word, your eternal word. Father, I thank you for every man and woman in this room. Father, their lives are open before you. And I pray that as we hear your word, that by your Holy Spirit you do within us all what only you can do. That you change us and uh, that we might become more and more like you, the living God. So, Father, we give you thanks. If there's someone in the room that's sick, we pray that you heal their body from head to toe. Father, if there's someone in the room that doesn't know you, we pray you that but before the end of this day that they may know you as Lord and Savior. So, Father, we give you thanks and praise for this time together. And uh, knowing that you're teaching... Not us. You're using us, but you're doing the teaching by your Spirit. And for these things, we give you thanks. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Job uh, Avila is going to kick things off this morning. And uh, I saw the I saw the uh, the pre-work that he did. And uh, so I think you're in for a real treat. And then um, I'll come in at the end and Try to follow that. God bless you. Joe? <coughs> Microphone's not working. Okay, we're going to try something new. I don't like talking into these things. That's why I wear this. Let me put this away. Okay, this is new. I don't like this thing. <laughs> Uh, first of all, welcome everyone. It's a uh, beautiful morning out there this morning, and uh, I, I expected a little bit of sunshine this morning, but it wasn't here, so I just want to say good morning to all of you, and thank you for coming. I want to insert a little correction, uh, a little statement in advance here from, uh, from last, uh, well, I was here three weeks ago, and I got booed. Oh, no. <laughs> I missed that. Yeah, I, uh, I incorrectly said that, I, well, Correctly, I said I, I go off script, uh, that I'm a Joe Biden guy. That's not right. <laughs> I meant to say I am as Joe Biden who goes off script and gets into trouble and doesn't know how to get back until, some, until they have a bunny coming out to get him out of the way. Uh, so... Uh, 
I just want to say I'll forgive you, whoever booed for me. Uh, yes, Jesus loves me. Thank you very much. Uh, next in my script, I wanted to visit a new... I, I, uh, we've been recording these Sunday morning programs for those of you that... Some of you can't make it every Sunday morning for Sunday school. Others never make it for, uh, you know, physical reasons or being homebound. And I'm in the process of getting that together. I have it set up. I've got probably the last four or five programs on there. And I will be giving the church the link to the uh, YouTube website so that you can go back. And uh, if you weren't here, look at the, at the Sunday morning teachings. Uh, I was prompted to do this uh, primarily because I told my, my family found out that I was doing this. And they wanted to know if it was on tape. And, uh, and then I, uh, I inherited a camera from, uh, from, from Mike, and I started recording these. And now my son is interested in looking at these videos. And so I'm doing the, the camera here for me to share with family and friends. And we're supposed to be doing one from the, uh, uh, from the little box up there. And uh, the sound from the other mic is not working, so I'm using this this morning. Uh, but before I start, uh, I know last week was uh, everybody was off schedule. We had three services, plus this this teaching, and then another teaching in the other room. And I uh, I happened to be in here while uh, Eldon was doing his presentation, and there were very few people in here. And I want to mention this morning that he did a super job in covering uh, First Samuel, and, and he really drilled down into the message of how God uses anybody. Liars, cheaters, murderers, white, black, anybody to get his message across and for, and for the sake of the salvation of his people. And I think Mike is going to do something like follow up on that. Uh, Mike, I, I never got to read your script. You know, I don't know. We'll see when I get up. Yeah, he doesn't know what he's going to do either. So we're all in this. I like Mike. We're in the same boat. We talked all week long, and then come Sunday morning, we don't know what we're going to do. But uh, I just hope I'm led by the Holy Spirit this morning. Can everybody hear me? Yeah. All right. I hope some of you, I, I know some of you are not going to be able to see the screen, but try to get a seat where you can. It's kind of crowded in here. What happened? <laughs> so anyway, um, three weeks ago, I left, I did a, a I call them a flyover uh, of judges. Uh, I mean, uh, not, uh, not judges, that was uh, Joshua. Okay, and I, uh, we learned a little bit about the book and about Joshua and some of the people at the time. And something I learned since then is that the Israelites, while Joshua was their leader, they all stayed holy. They all believed and they followed the, uh, the commandments of God. And even when Joshua died, they kept, they kept their, uh, their commandments until after the last of the elders that survived Joshua. And after that, another generation came in that they did not know God. And that's what led us into Judges and other books after that. So um, I, I remember I said that Joshua was a bridge between the previous four books of the Bible and then the following seven. So today, I want to link that Joshua with the next three, well, actually three books. I'm not doing Ruth today. It's, that's a different story that doesn't fit too well between what I between Judges and 1 Samuel, as far as I'm concerned, there's a, it's a private, beautiful story that you should study and read by yourselves. Or somebody else can do it some other time. Because it's a, that's a half an hour to 40 minute teaching just for the book of Ruth. Um, so anyway, I uh, think I've already said all that. I'm remembering better nowadays. So Judges began with the death of Joshua, basically tells the story of Israel's total failure after Joshua's death. That's where judges began. God sent forth judges. It was several years after, maybe 20, 30 years after Joshua died. While the other elders were still alive, they were still, they were still uh, holding and teaching their, 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 the Israelites what was going on and what, you know, how to stay holy with God. Now the book's name comes from the type of leaders that Israel uh, had in this period. And when I think of judges, and I've been in front of a few, if you, well, you don't know my past, so I'm telling you, I've been in front of a few, not as a witness. Uh, 
and it's not the guy with the with the black robe and the gavel and that. No, these were uh, uh, these were pretty people that uh, they were primarily uh, warriors, uh, 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 politicians of that sort. And uh, what they did is they they came to power. They came to to, to rise when when the people cried for help, and, and God brought about these judges. And uh, that's what that's what judges was all about. I um, I know that uh, Ron did a little bit on judges on uh, on Micah, one of the judges, and uh, and then I, that's all that was I think covered so far on that, because then Eldon followed with a great great story. Eldon, are you in here? Did he go to the other room? Eldon did a great job. Yeah, he's over here. Uh, last week I uh, I wasn't here, but we recorded it, and I and I and I went home and I watched it. You've got to watch when we give you the link. You got to watch his. Uh, presentation on on what he did with uh, First Samuel, and basically it's it's this story right here how God will use anyone that He needs to use to continue His uh, His plan. Remember way back when in January I said God has a plan, and that plan is not going to be altered by anyone. You know we're not going to destroy the earth ourselves. Okay, that's a little sidebar. <sighs> Now, in, uh, in the book, there's a large introduction that sets the stage for Israel's failure. Um, I'm jumping ahead to there. Yeah. Yeah. There's, um, you know, in chapters 1 and 2, if, when you read it, it, it shows how Israel failed to drive out the Canaanites. And uh, chapters 3 to 16, you'll see the corruption of the judges. And then... Uh, Chapters 20, 17 through 21 is the corruption of the people. And uh, that's, uh, that's just the beginning of uh, several hundred years, all the way until the, uh, until the, uh, until the exile. After, you know, that's what happened. This, they just kept going until finally God just exiled people. Uh, the opening section began, as I said here, with the territories in the promised land. And while Joshua defeated some key Canaanite towns, there was a lot of land uh, to be taken, and lots of Canaanites that were living in those areas. Uh, and, and chapter 2 describes how Israel just moved in alongside the Canaanites and adopted all their, all their cultural and religious practices. And it's right here that the story stops for only a whole chapter, uh, while the writer gives us an overview of everything that, that's about to happen in the body of this book. Uh, this is Judges, now we're still in this part of Israel history. The writer says that it was a series of cycles moving in a downward spiral. You know, the, the nation of Israel just kept, kept going. They would have a plateau where they, one of the judges came in, went to do battle once or twice with somebody, defeated an enemy, and, and then it would start all over again. So that's what happened. God would raise up a deliverer. That's another word for judges. For judge is a deliverer or savior. Um, and then... Uh, then Israel would uh, defeat the enemy and bring about an era of peace. But eventually Israel would sin again and it would start all over again. This cycle provides the literary, uh, the liter literary design and flow of the next main section of the book. It gets repeated for each of the six main judges whose stories are told here. I think, yeah. These are the, uh, there's six main judges and these are the first three right here. We have a, I can read these right here, uh, Othniel, Ehud, and Deborah. And, uh, and these are, uh, these are, this is a bloody, bloody, bloody book. Um, it's, uh, it's a bloody, uh, I mean, the stories are, are just horrible, horrible. There's a lot of, I mean, their descent is fast, okay? And then after these three, uh, I'm going to go on to Gideon, uh, Joyce. Joyce is going to try to follow me. Um, uh, and Gideon began, I know, but if you, uh, is Wayne in here? I don't know if Wayne is here. Oh, there's Wayne. <laughs> anyway, uh, Wayne belongs to the Gideons. Um, they invited me over last Thursday night to speak in front of the Gideons for some other long story. Uh, and I, I almost asked at the meeting, why did you choose Gideons for a name? But, no, but then later he told me. But Gideon began pretty well, but he was a coward of a man, but he eventually comes to trust that God can save Israel through him. And so he defeats 
a huge army of Midianites with only 300 men carrying torches and clay pots. But Gideon has a nasty, nasty temper, and he murders a bunch of fellow Israelites for not helping him in the battle. And then it, uh, and then it goes downhill from there. He makes an idol from the gold that he won in, in his battles, and then after he dies, all Israel worships that idol as a god, and, and the cycle begins all over again. The next main, main judge is Jephthah. I think it's Jephthah, who was something of a mafia thug. He lives up in the hills. And when things get really bad for Israel again, the elders come to Jephthah begging for his help, and Jephthah was a very effective leader. He didn't really want the job. <laughs> they had to coax him out of the, out of the hills. But he, uh, he won many battles against the Ammonites. But, as he was, but he was also unfamiliar with God, with the God of Israel. And he treats, uh, he treats God just like a Canaanite God. Uh, he vows to sacrifice. You know, it, he wanted to win so bad that he vowed to sacrifice his own daughter for a win in the next battle. And this tragic story just shows how far Israel had fallen. Uh, they no longer know the character of their own God, which leads to murder and to false worship. The last judge, Samson, is by far the worst. I, uh, I remember stories in movies and that about, <laughs> about Samson, and I thought he was like a hero, you know. Because uh, all we know, all we, what I remember about Samson when you mention Samson is Delilah, and that he was such a good comic that he brought the house down. <laughs> yeah, we got to have one of those. Now he was, he was promiscuous, violent, and arrogant. He did win. He won brutally, strategic victory, victories over the Philistines, but only at the, at the expense of his own integrity. And his life, as I just mentioned, it ends violently with mass murder. Okay, you'll notice a repeated theme in the main section of this book that uh, at key moments, God's spirit will empower each of these judges to accomplish these great acts of deliverance. And that's what Eldon was talking about. You have to, you have to watch, that was a real good, I really enjoyed that, that teaching. Now the fact that God uses this really disobedient people doesn't mean he endorses or even uh, or, or, or even uh, uh, you know, agrees with, with their decisions. But God is committed first and foremost to saving his people from all, all he has to work with. All he has to work with is corrupt leaders, and so work with them, he does. The whole section is designed now, this whole section is designed to show just how bad things have gotten. You can't even tell the Israelites from the Canaanites anymore. The final section of Judges shows Israel as a whole hitting bottom. These are two tragic stories, and here they're not for the faint of heart. These stories can be fully understood when reading the final verse in the book of Judges. Does anybody remember that final? You guys got to do your homework. In those days, Israel had no king, and everyone did. What was right in their own eyes. That's kind of like Noah's time, wasn't it? <laughs> no, I'm talking about today. Yeah, but the same thing. Human nature didn't change. Right now, we have about 330 plus million people in the United States. And how many people are doing this? They're doing what everything seems right in their own eyes. The spiral is still going on. This, that's the message we have here. You know, this, uh, these lessons have been posted, four of us here, for us to learn from that. It, things have not changed. Yeah. Things have not changed. And that's the point, is that the, it says here the Israelites had no king. But do we have a king? Do we have, we have a savior? We have a judge? Amen. But how many people in the United States or in the world are looking up to him as their leader, as their savior? And so things are not getting better. Worldwide, nationwide, things are just going down. Yeah. They're still going down that spiral. And uh, in the meantime, our job is to bring as many of these folks to Jesus as we can. Israel's descent into self-destruction is a result of turning away from the God who loves them and saved them out of slavery in Egypt. And now Israel needs to be delivered again for the, you know, from themselves. 
And um, the only glimmer of hope in the story is found in this repeated line is that Israel has no king. Israel will forego their own creator for a human substitute. And 1 Samuel will see that, okay, that Israel wants their own king and it's going to be a human. The story of Judges has value as a tragedy. As a tragedy, I'm talking about it now, Judges has value in it. It's a sobering explanation of the human condition, and ultimately it points out the need for God's grace to send a king who will, re who will rescue his people. You know, and that was the book of Judges. And that was a real quick look at the book of Judges. Reading it is a, uh, uh, it should wake people up a little bit. You should be able to, you know, uh, share the story with people because it, it, it's today. It's not an old fireside story being told by old shepherds sitting around a, uh, a puff of smoke on the ground, you know. So uh, now let's look at uh, First and Second Samuel here real quickly. What time is it? Oh, 20 after. Okay. So there are, um, there are three main prophets here. The prophet Samuel, where the book gets its name, is the, one of the three main characters in here. Then there's King Saul, and that's followed by King David. And all three of them transition Israel from a group of tribes ruled by judges into a unified kingdom ruled by, ruled by a king. In this case, it's going to be mostly King David. The book of Samuel has a fascinating design that weaves the story of these three characters together in four parts. Do we have them up here? Right. Okay, in 1 Samuel, we, uh, chapters 1 through 7, we, Samuel comes into, into, the, into the picture. And chapters 8 through 31, then Saul comes into the picture. And then in 2 Samuel, we're going to look at chapters 1 through 20. We can look at David. And then at the end of, at the end of 2 Samuel, uh, you know, uh, David goes into a long dissertation of woe is me and on and on and on. It's, it's listed here as an epilogue. And uh, it's a shame. It's, you know, he, but he looks back and uh, if you want to hear something, uh, somebody repenting and, and uh, knowing his wrongs in the past, uh, read that part too. Okay, uh, where am I at here? Samuel is a key leader. He is actually a prophet in the first section of the book, but then he also plays a key role in the next section, which is Saul's story, and it's told in two movements. One, Saul's rise to power and his failures, and the second part is about, the, about his downfall and his tragic death. Then the drama of Saul's demise is matched by David's exciting rise to power, and then David's story is told in two movements as well. First, he writes the wave of success, and then it's followed by his own tragic failure and the slow self-destruction of his family and then his kingdom. The book concludes with an epilogue that reflects back over the whole story. That's what I just mentioned here. So let's look at Samuel a little deeper and see how this all unfolds. Part one picks up from the chaos of the book of Judges and we're introduced to a touching story about a woman named Hannah. She is grieved because she had never been able to have children and by God's grace she finally has a son and she names him Samuel. With great joy she sings this amazing poem in chapter two. Then oh, the poem is all about how God opposes the proud and exalts the humble about how despite tragedies and human evil, God is working out his purpose in his story. Also, it's about how God will one day raise up an anointed king for his people. Now, Hannah's poem has been placed here at the beginning of the book to introduce the key themes that, uh, that uh, we're going to see throughout this whole story. But the next one, Samuel grows up and becomes a great prophet and leader for the people of Israel at the same time, the Philistines rise to power. They are Israel's arch enemies. Or is it arch enemies? A crucial battle, in a crucial battle, the Israelites get arrogant, and instead of praying and asking God for help, they march out with the Ark of the Covenant as this kind of a magic trophy that will automatically grant them victory in battle. Because of their arrogant presumption, God allows Israel to lose the battle and the Ark is stolen. The Philistine take the ark and they place it in, in their own temple, in their temple of God. 
His name is Dagon. And then the God of Israel defeats the Philistines and their Dagon and their God, Dagon, without any army. They just sent plagues on the people, the Philistines. So now the Philistines don't want the ark anymore, and obviously they don't want it. But, and they send it back to Israel. The point of this story seems to be this. God is not Israel's trophy, and he opposes pride among the Philistines, but also among his own people. So Israel needs to remain humble and obedient if they want to experience God's covenant blessing, which opens up into the next section. The Israelites come to Samuel and they say, we want a king like all the other nations. Go find one for us. And so Samuel, Samuel is very, very much against this, of course, and he goes to consult with God and God says, yes, their motives are all wrong. But if a king is what they want, give them one. We're introduced to the figure of Saul. Now Saul is a tragic figure because he begins full of promises. He is tall, he's good looking, he's a perfect candidate for a king, but he has deep character flaws. He's dishonest, he lacks integrity, and he seems incapable of, incapable of acknowledging his own mistakes. And so the flaws become his downfall. He wins some battles at the beginning, but his flaws run very deep. He eventually disqualifies himself by blatantly disobeying God's commandments. And so the aging Samuel now, he confronts Saul and Israel. He warned them. He warned the people that they would only benefit from a king who is humble and faithful to God. Otherwise, the kings of Israel will bring bereavement. I think they brought more than that. God informed Saul. Now this is God informing Saul that God is going to raise up a new king to replace him. And so now Saul's downfall is beginning at the same time. God is working behind the scenes in the meantime to raise up a new king. Who was that? David. David? So he's working in the back and in the, in the, in back to raise up a new king. Yeah, it's, a, it's, a, it's an insignificant shepherd. You know, just, you know the story. Everybody knows the story about the shepherd. And uh, I have a long teaching on how, how he became so uh, adept at slaying the enemy who confronts him. But that's a, that takes three rocks and a sling, and I don't have time. <laughs> He's the least likely candidate to be king, but the famous story of David and Goliath shows that God's choice of David is not based on his family status, but simply on his radical, humble trust in the God of Israel. This story embodies all of the themes of Hannah's poem, what we just went over coming into David, you know, what, what Hannah's song was all about. Go back and read Hannah's song. You can see that even, in, like I keep saying, it's today. Nothing changes. Saul and Goliath are depicted as low, while humbled David is exalted. And now from here we watch Saul slowly descend into madness while, while David rises to power. David started working for Saul as a general of his armies, and he's winning all these battles. He's also winning all the fame. Jealousy. Jealousy crept in. Saul gets jealous and starts chasing David around the country, hunting him, trying to kill him. And David's done nothing wrong. Uh, David simply runs and waits in the wilderness, and here we see David's true character. He has multiple opportunities to kill Saul, but he doesn't. He simply trusts that despite Saul's evil, God will raise up a king for his people. What's interesting, too, is that many of the poems of David that you read in the, in the book of Palms are linked to this very period of his life, and they all express the same attitude of trust. And so this section of the book ends with Saul coming to a grisly death after losing a battle with the Philistines. I won't go into that, not after breakfast. Uh, <laughs> First Samuel tells some of the most intricate, well-told stories you find anywhere in the Bible, and the characters Saul and David, they're portrayed very, very realistically. That's why I'm doing this. Uh, judges in First and Second Samuel are just like uh, you go, go to a store and pick up a book that you really enjoy reading. These characters are well, well-defined, and, 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 and like I said, it's not old stuff. This is not history. Now, you can find people like that living around us in this world today. That's right. Yeah. 
In Saul's story, we see a warning. It's crucial that we reflect on our own character flaws and how they harm us and other people. Been there. And with God's help, we need to humble ourselves and deal with our, with our dark side so that Saul's story doesn't become us or ours. David, on the other hand, is presented as an example of patience and trust in God's timing in our lives. While running through the wilderness, being chased by Saul, David had every reason to think that God would abandon him. But David doesn't think that. He knows. He's, he, he, he believes, in his, uh, he believes in, his, in, his, in his Lord. And so David's story encourages the trust that despite human evil, God is working out his purposes to oppose the proud and to exalt the humble. Amen. Again, Eldon's story. Eldon's story was just that. You know, God is working out his purposes to exalt the proud and to, not to exalt, to oppose the proud and to exalt the humble. Thanks for that one, man. That was good. Eldon, that was very good. Here we transition into 2 Samuel. 2 Samuel picks up after Saul's death and David surprises everyone by composing this long poem where he laments the death of every man, of the very man who tried to murder him. The Israelites come to David then and they ask him to unify all the tribes as their king. So the first thing David does, as he, used to, he is used to doing, is to go to the city of Jerusalem. He conquers it and establishes it as Israel's capital, which he renames as Zion. And from there David goes on and wins many battles, and he expands the territory greatly. Now, after making Jerusalem the political capital of Israel, he wants to make it their religious capital as well. Remember, God hasn't told him to do it. It says that David wants to do this. So he asks the Ark of the, so he has the Ark of the Covenant moved into the city. And then in 2 Samuel chapter 7, David tells, I have it, he tells God, he, he suggests it to God uh, that Israel has a, that he sh Israel should have a permanent home. He thinks that the government's president should also get a permanent house. So he asks God if he can build a temple for the God of Israel. But God says to David, "Thank you for that thought. <laughs> Not now." <laughs> now in Second Samuel chapter seven, and now this is a key chapter for understanding the storyline of the whole Bible, because God makes a promise to David that from his royal line will come a future king who's going to build God's temple here on earth and set up an, earth, an eternal kingdom. Right. I can't see the time. And, it's, uh, and, it's a, and, and this messianic promise to David that gets picked up and it's developed more in the book of Psalms and also in the books of the prophets. And it's this king that gets connected to God's promise to Abraham. The future messianic kingdom will be how the how, that brings, how it brings his blessing to all the nations. And it's right here in the midst of all this divine blessing that, that things go horribly, horribly wrong for David. David makes a fatal mistake. Not, not fatal for him, but for the man named Uriah, one of David's prized soldiers. So from his rooftop, David sees Uriah's wife bathing. David arranges for her to, you know, there goes a description how beautiful she is and and so forth. So David arranges for her to be brought to him. He sleeps with her. He gets her pregnant, and then he tries to cover the whole thing up by having Uriah assassinated, and then he marries her. Yes, yeah. David is confronted by the prophet Nathan about all of this. That's a beautiful little how he um, confronted David with a uh, metaphor type of a story. And of course, then. David immediately owns up to what he has done. He's broken. He repents. He has got to forgive him. And God does forgive him. But God. But God doesn't erase the consequences of David's decisions. And so as a result of this horrible choice, David's family, his kingdom, all falls apart. And it makes this section of a tragic story much like Saul's downfall. So David's sons end up repeating his mistakes, but then, in, in even more tragic ways, Ammon sexually abused his sister, Tamar. Ammon sexually, um, uh, let's see, Tamar. And then their brother, Absalom, finds out about all of this and, and has Ammon assassinated. 
And then Absalom goes and he, and he hatches the secret plan to oust his father David from power, and he launches this full-scale power rebellion. So for a second time, David is forced to flee from his own home and go hide in the wilderness, except this time he is not an innocent man. The rebellion ends when David's son is murdered. It breaks David's heart, and so again, he laments over the very men who try to kill him. David's last days find him back on his throne, but as a broken man, wounded by the sad consequences of his sin. The book concludes with, with a well-crafted epilogue with stories that are out of chronological order, but they have this really great symmetrical literary design. The previous pair of stories come from earlier in David's reign, and they compare to the failures of Saul and then of David, how each of them hurt other people through their bad decisions. The next pair of stories are about David and his band of mighty men who went about fighting for the Philistines and what, what's interesting in that both sections have a story of David's weakness in the battles. In contrast to the victorious debut of chapter 1 through 9, here we see a vulnerable David who was very dependent on others for help. The center epilogue, let's see, the center epilogue has two poems that act like memoirs and David reflects back on his life, and he remembers time when God graciously res rescued him from danger. And he sees these as moments where God was faithful to his covenant promise to him and to his family. Both poems conclude by looking back on the hope of God's promise of a future king who will build that eternal kingdom. These poems and God's promises also connect back to him as the poet that opened the book. These key passages from the beginning, the middle, and the end of the book bring these themes to books all together, despite Saul and David's evil. God remained at work, moving forward. His redemptive purposes as God opposed David and Saul's arrogance, but God exalted David when he humbled himself. The future, the future hope of this book reaches far beyond David himself. That looks to the future of the messianic king who will one day bring God's kingdom and his blessing to all the nations. And that's my story today. <laughs> Mike, I hope I left you some. Thank you, Joe and Joyce. They did a great job. Yeah. Yes. Worked together so well this morning in the. Uh... Good job, Joe. Joe, I've got to give this thing a lot of patience here. This morning and in, in the, the time that we have, if you have an assignment and you need to leave, that's okay. So just go ahead and do whatever you need to do. Um, the purpose of the uh, Old Testament portion of our reading plan for this year, it's really to see Jesus in everything that we say and do. Uh, Jesus, that crimson thread throughout the scripture, throughout the Old Testament, and then the substance or the reality in the New Testament. So as you read, as you listen to the different teachers and facilitators that we have, as you, as you read and listen, uh, ask God to reveal, if it's not obvious, ask Him to reveal His Son throughout what you're reading. It'll bring it to life in a way that's, that's incredible. This morning, uh, just quickly, Paul wrote to Timothy and he reminds him and us here today that all scripture is given by inspiration of God. It's profitable for doctrine, for proof, for proof, for correction, and for instruction in righteousness in 2 Timothy 3. So over the next few minutes together, uh, I want to travel back. Joe's done a great job of overview, and I'm just going to take bits and pieces out of that. But uh, there's a fascinating thing here in, in these chapters that I want to bring to the surface a little more. And uh, so I want to travel back some 3,000 years via the scripture to God's man, David. He was a man after God's own heart. I want you to remember that, a man after God's own heart. And he demonstrated valor and bravery when he fought wild animals. Everyone knows those stories. We're going to hear more about that in the service this morning. But uh, he fought bravely, endangering his own life to do what? To protect what he had been given to protect. He knew why he was there, and he did exactly what he was supposed to do. That's important. 
And this attitude continued on throughout his life. And it was shown again in his fight against Goliath. We're going to hear more about that this morning. And Goliath was mocking God and the armies of Israel. Not a good thing to do. And so David's courage and faith in God gave him victory, as Joe mentioned a little earlier. I'd like you to turn quickly to Acts 13.22, the book of Acts 13.22. We're going to refer to this a couple of times. Acts 13.22. And I'm hoping that after we get through this morning that you focus on this scripture because I think it's not what we think it says. I think it says something completely different if we'll let the Lord do this work here. Let me, and reading, this is the Apostle Paul, and really this is a combination of two scriptures, which was not unusual for rabbis to do. So, reading it says, after, this is Paul, after removing Saul, King Saul, he raised up David as their king and testified about him. I have found, God always, man's not seeking God, God seeks man. I have found David, son of Jesse, listen, a man after my own heart. He will carry out my will in its entirety. The Amplified says carry out my program fully. The qualifier here to be a man after God's own heart is what? That he will carry out God's will in its entirety. That's the qualifier. That's the key. It's not something that you necessarily do. I'll get into that a little bit later. But uh, that's the key. So after the death of King Saul, David, the man after God's own heart, took his rightful place as the king of Israel. And uh, he lived a life of service. That's what David was all about. He knew his mission, and he was determined to complete what he had been assigned. So he delivered Israel from their oppression. This is the part, David trusted God. That's, that's, that attribute is more important than just about anything else except maybe one other. Yes. And that is, is that he, above all things, was about pleasing God and not man. Pleasing God Amen. and not man. We need that today more than anything else we can do. Stand firm to please God. But over time, though a man after God's own heart, he fell numerous times and he lived with the consequences of his failures until, until his death. But as Joe alluded to earlier, God made a promise to David in 2 Samuel 7. I'm just going to read that again because it's important. It says, when your days are fulfilled and you, you rest with your fathers, that means that David was going to die like every other man, I will set up your seed after you who will come from your body, and I will establish his kingdom, and he shall build a house for my name. Who was what or who? I'm always going to who or whom. But he was going to build a house. Uh, I wonder what that house could be built from. Living stones, maybe? I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. So we're going to look at Acts. You don't have to turn there. I'll read it. Acts 13.23. Acts 13.23. And uh, it says, and by the way, this is the Apostle Paul's. If you don't know this or you haven't read it, it starts in chapter 13, I think, verse 16. This is the only fully recorded in Scripture sermon of Paul preaching the gospel yeah. from beginning to end. If you haven't read that, read it. It's, it's the gospel, and then for the scoffers, he's got a little something extra for them. You don't want to miss that. So if you're not familiar with that, read it. He was preaching in the synagogue at Pisidian Antioch, which was a Roman colony. And this is what Paul said, verse 23. And it's one of King David's descendants, and then he calls, he calls him by name, Jesus, who is God's promised Savior of Israel. Yep. And then in Matthew 1.1, 1, 1, again, Jesus, son of David, son of Abraham. So let's take a brief scriptural look at what a true man of God, 
or a man after God's own heart looks like, and that why Jesus, the God-man, God incarnate, is truly a man after God's own heart. Jesus tells us that he never did anything that he didn't see his heavenly Father do. John 5, 19, Jesus says, I tell you the truth. Jesus never sinned, never lied. He said, I tell you the truth. The Son can do nothing by himself. He does only what he sees the Father doing. And whatever the Father does, whatever he does, the Son does also. That's an obedient Son. Jesus said that he didn't... He didn't say anything that he didn't hear his heavenly Father say. In John 12, 49 and 50, Jesus speaking says, I don't speak on my own authority. The Father who sent me has commanded me what to say and how to say it. What to say and how to say it. That is a man with his ear turned to the very voice of God. I don't, I don't speak on my own authority. Verse 50, I know his command leads to eternal life. Why was God's mission to Jesus so important? He had to do exactly what his father did, and he had to say exactly what his father said. Why? Because all of our eternal destinies hung in the balance, and he was an obedient son. And finally, Jesus humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death. The third thing, even death on the cross, Philippians 2. Mm -hmm. David's prom God's promise to David in 2 Samuel 7 was hinged on the resurrection of Jesus. Yes. Why is that important? Because Jesus' resurrection was the stamp of approval from God. God the Father, that Jesus was a man after his own heart. Why? Because he completed his mission in its entirety. Amen. He completed his mission in its entirety. That's why it's so important. So remember verse 22 of Acts 13. He will carry out my will in its entirety. Jesus of Nazareth is who... God had in mind from the beginning. Yes, yes. David and all the others were mere shadows. Jesus carried out the will of God completely to the letter. He is the good shepherd. You can trust God to fight your battles. Listen to me. It's not so you don't take that on your own. Just like the Israel, Israeli army, they were in the hills and in their tents and they were hiding. But David went and battled that one. Well, our Savior did more than that. He defeated our enemy. We walk in that victory today. Amen. And you can trust him and he is the beginning and end of all things. Let's look to him and for him by faith until he comes. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we give you thanks for your word. We thank you, Father, that all these things were done before the very foundations of the earth. And Father, we look back over what you've accomplished through your Son. And Father, I pray today, without exception, that every man and woman in this room begins to or continues to look to you in every situation, that by the, your very spirit that you change them from the inside out and that they become fearless because of not what they've done and what who they are, but who Jesus is and what he's done. So, Father, we give you thanks and praise this day for your word. It's eternal, and we look forward to the time. Come quickly, Lord Jesus. Amen. 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 Thank you, Mike.